Hi, this is Pierre Sabak and today we're going to be interviewing Neil Haig. Neil Haig is perhaps most famous for his um, illustrations of David Icke's various books. Um, I think we'll, we'll, we'll start first of all from your biographical details and quickly, I know this is on record, but we'll just go over your biographical details and we'll also cover some of your main points which you're known in terms of your illustrations with David. So if you just want to tell me sort of the basics, where you graduated and what you did and we'll take it from there. It's nice to see you again, Pierre. <laughs> Lovely to see you. It's nice to see you again. <laughs> right. um, where did I graduate? Not that it means much to me at, the, uh, at all these days, but mm. I, I basically did I did a degree in, in art and design like most right. people do. Mm. And then I went on to do a, a master's in book illustration, okay. which leads comfortably into all the other work that I yeah. did in terms of illustration yeah. work. Um, what else did I do? Some teacher training, yeah. um, and then I got into real self discovery in terms of right. the things that interested me. Okay, so in terms of matter and paintings and, and looking at other artists. And I'd, I'd like to just ask you in terms of which artists influenced you. So, we'll, shall we start with some conventional artists that people may be aware of? Yeah, as, as a student, I was into narrative illustration work, which was things like uh, Raymond Briggs, people will know okay. the snowman, and yeah. that kind of yeah. fungus, the bogeyman. Yeah. Um, I was looking at other, other artists, uh, yeah. contemporary illustrators like. Uh, uh, there was James Marsh at the time, mm. I think. Arthur Rackham's work, you know, okay. all these very classic intricate, Edwardian. Intricate, yeah, uh, and then really fell fell upon mm. people like well, William Blake's been the biggest influence. Yeah, I was going to say that so. if, if I look at your artwork, uh, the strong influences that I think are obviously William Blake. I also see some David Ockney in there in terms of the oh, bright okay. colours. And also Henry Moore as Tell well. Yorkshireman, David Ockney. Yeah, he's, yeah he's, he's not far from this neck of the No, no, he? and also Henry Moore as well. Oh yeah, of course, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, with the um, radiations or the grids which uh, he used for his sculpture. So, um, yeah, I mean, the art world, I didn't, I, I wasn't really an artist, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't seeing mm. myself as an artist, it was always as an illustrator. Right. And as a graphic designer. Yeah. Um, but I, I fell in love with the the idea of illustration, mm. the idea of illuminating yeah. text, yeah. illuminating stories. So this is no tradition, isn't it, with yeah. illuminating Conceptual work becoming an image in itself, yeah. in its own right. You could have a narrative mm. in one image, yeah. or you could have a narrative that spans over th several pages. But I was interested in yeah. narratives and stories, yeah. hence why I ended up illustrating books for other people. But not only that, mm. Um, writing and illustrating graphic stories myself over the last what 15 yeah. years or so so yeah it's you told me an interesting anecdote and this was a number of years uh, years ago but you said that you went um, you were doing very conventional illustrations for the economist and for a number of large magazines and suddenly this work just suddenly dried up when um, you oh, started to work yeah. with David Ike well, um, yeah, it, well, it could have been coincidental. Right. Um, it, it could have just been, it could have a couple of things, it could have been coincidental. Yeah. It could have been the nature of the times that we were moving yeah. through, because that was in the 90s. Yeah. And yeah. that was in the, in the mid-90s, and that's when I started mm -hmm. to kind of connect with that kind of work I was doing for David. Right. And I think the illustration industry started to die its death a little bit at the same time. The transition of computers, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, was was the Mac was coming in, yeah. yeah. So it was kind of... You know, it was it was it was a bit like that. Yeah, okay, it's yeah. Well, it's year dot, isn't it? It's the same with what happened with the invention of the printing press, the Guggenheim of printing yeah. press. Um, it changed so everything. It's changed everything. We're in the year dot, the beginning of. I think we're also, if I remember, we, we were kind of on the edge of we were coming out of a recession. Yeah. Um, at the same time, there was all sorts of things happening, but on a metaphysical level, I was losing interest in illustration work, right. commercial illustration yeah. work. Yeah in the 90s yeah. in favour of getting more into the deeper mm. you know occult metaphysical right. concepts mm. that I was starting to uncover yeah. and I was allowing things just to come through um, yeah. and, and allowing things to be yeah, um, but you know, uh, as they were your uh, early illustrations are very astro theological in terms of that you have illustrations of Sirius and there's a lot of emphasis towards um, symbolism and native symbolism um, you seem to be interested that you seem to be interested in a lot of different cultures but particularly maybe native native Indian would you say? yeah American Indian was one of the big ones yeah. at the time that I was interested in I mean I'm interested in everything now yeah. but um, 
there was a there was one particular well there's one particular story and one image in, in particular mm. I think back in 94 right I did uh, I did a series I was I was still kind of on the edge of a postgraduate yeah. study and I entered what was then the images best mm. of British illustration competition right. and um as everybody did back then, you know, mm. I don't know if it exists now. And I entered a, a, an illustration called, and it came out of nowhere, called Here Comes the Moon. <laughs> right. right. And it was an image, if anybody, it's on the website, it's yeah. an image of what looks like a devil like figure, an energy field, yeah. blowing the moon towards mm. the earth. Yeah. And around the earth are these kind of angelic forces, and the mm. sun is positioned in a very kind of uh, you know, very native, kind of primitive, abstract, yeah, naive nice style, style. Yeah, and know. and it had a certain energy to it. Mm -hmm. And I was told when I when I made this illustration, bear in mind I was still in the commercial world right. a little bit here, mm -hmm. that this was kind of a, a channeled thing. I like, yeah. What does that mean? You know, but at mm -hmm. the time, anyway, a channeled image. Right. And it wasn't until a year or so later mm -hmm. that it kind of started to make sense why I made the image. Right. Because it was the same image that I sent with a pack of images mm. through to what was then, you know, Dave, David's uh, office yeah. for, the, for the early days. Right. Um, and that was, that, that image was one of the images that connected us. So, okay, and that was the catalyst which led to... One of the catalysts, yeah. yeah the um, new work, or the work which profoundly changed then from commercial illustration to more spiritual, Gnostic illustration. Yeah, it was, I was going where I was meant to go with, right. with the imagery, I, I, and, yeah. and, that was in the, and that was the next part of the journey for me. Yeah. Um, yeah and so, so um, which books did you illustrate for David I? Because there's been a number, haven't there? Um, oh gosh! Um, 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 well, the, all the, the big ones. Yeah, uh, you know the, the human big, the, race get off your Yeah, knees. that's the big one. What ten? That's eight years ago now, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. and then the um, conspiracy one, the Green Book. I'm trying to remember the. Um, okay, yeah, I can't remember the name of it. The guide one. Um, yeah, but I, I illustrated perception, deception, and found myself. The, the, yeah. The, the, oh yeah, she the did the last one. And I've done a lot of other things besides that as mm. well. I mean, as you know, I've illustrated your book covers. Yeah. Um, as, well. I, uh, as, you, as you would know, of course, <laughs> unless you've got a very short memory, <laughs> I've got uh, a short memory yeah. <laughs> which I know you haven't, oh, yeah. um, and, and, and other projects, you know, mm. I've been involved in other little bits and bobs everywhere. Right, you know, okay. So, so, um, so that's, um, we've looked at in terms of your illustrations, I'm kind of very interested in, in your ideas about symbology and some of your ideas about Gnosticism. Uh, you were t talking a little bit earlier about this picture. Oh yeah, this oh. old painting here. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, well, do you want to just give um, a very sharp deconstruction of the painting and then maybe we could go into That's the in there, isn't it? You can see all that. Yeah, yeah awesome. that's okay. So, um, well, you see, I was, as I was saying to you earlier, I think this was painted in the 90s. Mm. And, uh, you know, I'm reminiscing here a little bit because I, I, I even stretch this canvas, you know. <laughs> I don't do that very often these days. Mm. Um, it, it was, I, I, I went on a... To keep the story shortish, but yeah. I, went, I went on a, a, a long walk mm. in France mm. in the Landoc Roussillon region, mm. which was very it's very famous for its Cathar right. history. Mm. And the Cathars were a um, a Christian. They were called a Christian sect, of course, yeah. because they were they they had certain beliefs that were mirrored within mm. what we would understand as Christianity. However, I think the roots of their belief system comes from further afield. From the Gnostics. From the Gnostics, mm. uh, as a general term. Yeah. And you could find Cathars in, in what is now Albania and, right. and uh, places like Croatia. Um, you could probably find them even as far north as Denmark. Do you think they were a renegade movement in terms of that they broke up away from the church or were they just something that grew organically? I think it was growing. I think it was growing organically. Or do you think it was seeded from the Gnostic traditions that there were teachers who were going out and seeding these teachers? But as I think I think it was organic, but I think there was some real hard. Let's use the word hardcore yeah. characters that right. were, were were pushing a a, a Gnostic mm. idea. Yeah. Not in a ma malicious way. No. But they, they were they were flourishing. Like they say, yeah. seeded is a good word. Yeah. They were growing yeah. in certain parts of what is now. We would understand this mm. palace, what is, what is Palestine, was Palestine, right. you know, the, in Egypt, right through into Spain. Mm. And it brings us back to this, because this is in the foothills of where Spain and France yeah. meet each other in the Pyrenees, right. where from around the 10th century, mm. there was the starting yeah. focus of a, a group of people that were not necessarily going to become mm. 
what the order of the day yeah. wanted them to become. And by the 11th century, yeah. Catharism or Cathar, it yeah, had its own distinctive flavour. Abby, Abby Jensen, yeah. um, which wine in French, um, they they were a group of people mm. that were from all sorts of different backgrounds, yeah. from different kind of they didn't have incomes in those days, but let's say income brackets, yeah. from poor to wealthy, yeah. that that were for, that had fallen in love mm. with the Gnostic version of mm. what was then the predominant religion of Christianity, from yeah. Byzantine right down to, you know, the, the Abrahamic yeah. faiths. Was, so, there, was there a distinct teaching with the, um, uh, with the Cathars? Um, well, well, they, they were, their main, their main focus, from, from my understanding, mm. is that they were, they were interested in putting into practice the actual teachings of the one they ended up calling Jesus right, okay. in, the, in the biblical sense yeah. and they, they abstained in such a way from all of the worldly mm. uh, physical material things yeah. because in the Gnostic tradition they, they, they believed mm. uh, that the material world and, and the physical world to, to a greater degree yeah. was the work of in their terms, I'm going to use their, their, their mm. terms, not something I would use, but the work of the devil right. in symbolic terms. Are we talking about the Demiurge? Are we talking yeah, about the Demiurge. Um, right. I mean, you know, we, we can talk about Lucifer and the devil and yeah. all those things as well if you want yeah. to, but, in, but they're, they're different things, mm. you know, and so is Satanism, it's mm. a very different thing. Your which, which is completely different. Yeah, it's completely different. Because again, in the Luciferic traditions, Lucifer is seen as one who enlightens. Yeah, so, that's right, and I think it's a lot more to do with what we would understand as astronomy, yeah, um, yeah. Than, than anything else, you know, at, on one level. Mm. But the Cathars, I think, were, were pure Gnostics mm. that were bending towards Christianity. Because remember, right. Gnosticism was around before Christianity, yes. Yes. so they were they were using the Christian um, doctrine yeah. as much as it was credible. I was yeah. saying, I think I was saying to you earlier before we started doing the interview that. Yeah. Then in, at the Council of Nicaea mm. in 300 AD, there was mentions mm. through the th through the arguments with Arius. Mm. There was men mentions of Cath the Cathar sects or the Cathar yeah. priests, mm. and at that time they were seen as um, very um, very pure and and, mm. and coming from a different background to the the, the then becoming. Roman the church, Christian yeah. version, which was very decadent, very, very different. Yeah. yeah. So they were already around. But do you what, think that they were interpreted as a threat? And at this they were eventually. Mm. Yeah. Not then they weren't. They were seen as they were seen as something not to be bothered by. It was right. Trivial. Well, yeah. oh, yeah. there's one or two characters. They mm. they have a slightly different belief to the Christian yeah. uh, Roman ca Catholic, which became Catholic. And I guess they were left alone. Thinking that they could be integrated at some point. Yeah, they were just left alone. Yeah. Um, and I think eventually, what happened when you when you don't focus on something for so long and you're mm. too busy doing other things. Mm. Let's not forget Christianity went through its extremist, yeah. uh, you know, sort of era, mm. almost to the point of jihadists. Yeah. yeah, around 400 AD when they were right. destroying the, tem the temple and the library of yeah. Alexandria and killing yeah. Hypatia and mm. the Gnostics then. Mm. So, you know, they, they went through that and the Cathars, let's say, rode that, yeah. stayed hidden. The Cathars didn't emerge as the Cathars until no. much later, yeah. but the Gnostics rode that out. Right. Okay. And then they re-emerged. Mm. Um, they'd already been around, I think, in Palestine as something, mm. or as a body called the Essenes. You've mm. probably heard of. Yeah. Uh, around the so-called time of, of, you know, the Roman occupation yeah. of what is now yeah. Palestine. You see, Israel. you see, when I think of the etymology of Cathar, I automatically think of Catholic, and I know that they're obviously very distinct. But there's a part of me which is thinking that this is a hidden Catholic, a Catholic tradition which has sort of snapped off or broken away from the Roman well, Church. Could, could, I mean, look, I don't know about the etymology, and it mm. could be mm. because they were around from the time of the Council of Nicaea. Yeah. So, and you see, I think the possible. Council of Nicaea, and I think this is one of the big theological debates that they were talking about the nature of divinity of, of Christ and whether Christ was human or whether he was a demigod. The, whether he was human angelic yeah. and I think that this this is what it's centred upon and then you come into two distinct 
occult traditions, and we were talking about this early, earlier. This you've got the human tradition, and then you've got the seraphic tradition, and both of these traditions are, are, are part of the occult tradition, but which are hidden. And I think the arguments about the nature of Christ and what Christ constituted was he this grafted bloodline, or was he human? Were intrinsic to the arguments to the Cathars. Now. Mm. My understanding of the Cathars is that they interpreted Christ to be human and that they interpreted that humans could become godlike or ascended. Um, but they, were, they, they saw that the Anthropos, which is the, the human, um, became corrupted through the um, genetic interbreeding between yeah, angels yeah. and men. And, uh, and so this tradition was running throughout the um, Cathar and, and the Gnostic traditions. Yeah, I, I think you're right. And that and that goes back to yeah. an Gnostic yeah. understanding. Well, this is then the at the time of the Cathars mm. in France. I think they were probably very much still caught up in some of the restraints yeah. of what was Catholicism yeah. in, in the making. Mm. But I think you're right. Mm. And I, I it, what's interesting is that the idea of a man mm. rather than a deity. Yeah. One of the um, one of the uh, the things they were they were um, being persecuted for were, mm -hmm. were their uh, what became a heresy right. was their belief in mm -hmm. or their, their understanding of some kind of goddess Stuff. connection right. to, to what we would what they called um, Christ. Yeah. And that's a Gnostic thing as well. Yes. Because yes. you've got the idea of Sophia, yeah. the goddess. Yeah. Uh, or the goddess of wisdom, mm. so fine meaning wisdom in Greek, as you, as you know, and um, and then the Christ or the Christ energy, yeah. which is coming from the pleroma mm. beyond this world, yeah. and the, the the merging of the two to create or birth mm. a third reality. Mm. Yeah, the Cathars, I, from what I've seen, were did not rule out the 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 possibility mm. of a what became, or the writers have talked about it, the Magdalena bloodline. Yeah. And, and it makes you wonder when the church were really going for the Cathars, yeah. which was based, the persecution of them and the crusade against them was based on a, on a lie. Mm. They were actually trying to kill two birds with one stone, right. which was remove the women, mm. the women priests, yeah. Because they were the Cathars were some of the, the the leading priests back in the 12th century were 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 women. There were right. men and women. Mm. However, the Cathars on one level had the Roman Catholic kind of um, state of mind, mentality, where the yeah. mentality where they also travelled in pairs of the same sex. Right. They you know they would have never have been a man and a woman travelling together as Cathar. Right. Uh, even though I painted a picture recently of a man <laughs> and a woman Cathar, that's because there were exceptions. Yeah. And, and if they did travel together, that was also part of the religious See, this is from, yeah. you know, from, from But I was just thinking about in terms of Templar symbolism, you have uh, two people on the horseback, and again this links into twin symbolism and um, the idea of uh, a lord and a protector of the lord, so they kind of, there are different levels of interpretation. Oh yeah, I think you're right there, yeah, there's many levels to it, yeah. of course, yeah. I think some of it's some unconscious, mm. isn't it? It's, yeah, it's subliminal. Yeah, subliminal. They don't know why they're doing it, but they're doing it because the one of the reasons uh, the Cathars were persecuted as well, I think, at that time, which back to this, because this is meant to be a, a, a Cathar priest or, a, yeah. or, what, or what they call the parfait in French, which is the perfect ones. Right, okay. That's, that's, what, they, that's what they were called. They were perfected. Yeah. But they were perfected through an initiation process, yeah, which really lasted right. three years. And we were talking earlier about self-initiation being yeah. the highest form of initiation. Yeah. Yeah. And the reason why I painted this is because I went on this, this trek mm. with my partner at the time. Mm. Um, and it was a real initiation process, yeah. funny if there was two of us, mm. you know. <laughs> um, and we walked the ancient Cathar mm. roads, yeah. which stretch um, all over that region, but they're called the Sentinel. The, the, the roads of the Cathar, right. which go from the, the Mediterranean coast near Perpignan mm. and the south of Nabon, mm. from the Chateau Kelibus all the way through, right, right through the, the, the woods and the forest, which mm. follow tracks through the Gorge of Galamus, mm. uh, Bougaresh, right. uh, St. Julien de Bec, you know, all these places as you move down, yeah. and ending up in places like Montsegur and Foix. Right. Uh, you know, it was, it was about 80 
80 miles right. worth of, of, of and walking. And did you manage to complete the trek? Apart from the apart from getting on a bus at one point, <laughs> absolutely shattered, towards the end, yeah. uh, to take a few miles out, yeah. um, and being attacked by a horse fly as we climbed the right. the, the, the Montega mm. uh, mountain, or the rock, it's called mm. Pog actually. Mm. Um, there was a lot of, there were, the journey le led to a lot of insight and a lot yeah. of reflection, mm. self-reflection, mm. but also seeing things in nature that would make you realise yeah. the, the nonsense of, of the material world yeah. and, how, and how, we, how we are living and what we mm. do. I'll give you a good example actually with the painting, based mm. on the painting was, by the time we'd climbed Mon to, towards Montego back yeah. then, and we'd been attacked by horse fly, mm. buggers they are, you know, and they look right. human sweat. Mm. And it was above 90 degrees, and right. even though you were at an altitude which was fairly high. Mm. Um, and as we descended down the other side to only look up at the, vi the village of Montego mm. with that in the background, there was, uh, I, I mean, I'd been fighting off horse fly yeah. for about, I would say, nearly six or seven miles of right. doing, <laughs> doing this, you know. And um, as we descended, yeah. I noticed there was a guy laying in the long grass, right? You know, with a with a piece of grass out of his mouth like that. And I had a closer look, and he only had shorts on, right? And he was like this, <laughs> and there was not a thing around him. Yeah, there was no flies or anything. That's Obviously, right. because he wasn't sweating, because yeah. they all that, you know. Yeah. But it just made me realise that the, the 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 hustle and bustle of everyday existence. Yeah. You know the 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 feelings of being entrapped and yeah. having to be go from A to B. Yeah. You know whether, whether it's through jobs or relationships. Yeah. You know, we're not getting into it all, but you know what I mean. Yeah, it's, it's the um, timetable, isn't it? Being up at the same time, doing the same thing. Day part of day. that. It's part of that understanding that when you when you you can cage somebody mm -hmm. even within what they feel that they're in, they're on some kind of path to freedom, they can still be in a cage. Yeah. The salmon mm. thinks it's on its way home, but still but still finds itself trapped in a cage and being farmed. Yeah. And also attracts parasites, mm. funnily enough. There was parasites attacking me in terms right. of symbolically the horse fly, but the guy in the grass was at peace, yeah. enjoying nothing mm. but just being in that moment yeah. of stillness. And nothing was and there bothering. Were no parasites around. There was nothing <laughs> bothering me. And it just made me realise that this the journey itself is, yeah. is it is hard yeah. you know life is hard mm. in that respect but there are moments when we get that peace yeah. and I found yeah, it on that journey mm. and this painting this this Montsegur painting and the, 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 the priest and it's it's called White Castle Initiation right Earth through fire it's kind of interesting because I've found this painting now for probably you new have that's new right ten, yeah. nearly <laughs> 10 years that's right but I always presumed that this was the New Jerusalem and I didn't know well, the backstory to the Well, painting. the thing is, though, no, you're, you're in the right area. The New Jerusalem is there, mm. but it's not a physical location. Yeah. And as I've said in graphic it's novels a, and things, it's, it's actually a place that is located mm. in the human heart. Yes. And therefore, this, this Cathar priest is mm. entering through like a baptism of fire. Mm is going through one dimension into the other. Yeah. And at the time when I painted it, you know, there was all that talk of the Mayan calendar, which is gone. All gone. <laughs> and, and, if you, and if you remember, within the glyphs of the Mayan calendar, there was mm. this talk about different castles. Right, like, okay. White castle and, and yellow castle and all yeah. the different glyphs. Mm. And it kind of all made sense. Mm. The baptism of fire mm. and the movement through fire, of course, the many cathos yeah. died through, mm. through the from mm. fire, yeah. and it was all kind of contained within. Well, the Greek, the, the Greek etymology for heaven is um, what is it? Em Empurious uh, through the fire. So I heaven was seen as being fire. Mm. This is why the church demonised it because they said that if you go into heaven, they, they actually reverse it and said, no, you're actually going to hell. Obviously, the fire links into the near death experience That's as well, in which people move towards the light. So again, it's trying to preempt that experience and trying to introduce fear to the near-death process of passing on to the next dimension. Controlling that, yeah. that, that yeah. passing, yeah. Yeah. yes, yeah. yeah. Which is, and I think, yeah, yeah. Bit, because I think with the, and this is my interpretation in terms of the afterlife and what I know, what you're dealing here is with the imaginal realm. So you're going back to what Plato referred to as the universal forms, where all ideas exist. And this is a, a level of reality which is underlying reality, but then it's manifested in, in terms of what Plato talks about as particular forms. So there's this relationship between the spirit and the physicality or the mm -hmm. manifestation of the form, which researchers like Talbot would talk about as the holographic universe. But going back, 
I, I think that the um, dying is very much like the dream state, this is the imaginal realm. And so it's very important in terms of your level of consciousness, in mm. terms of how, when you die, the level of consciousness is important. And I remember, this was a long time ago now, but I, I was on an airplane when we were flying to Japan and it fell like 3,000 feet out of the sky. The lights went out, the, um, the people who were serving food, they, they kind of went really low and were walking low and on their hands and knees. And I was thinking, I'm going, I, you know, I could die here, this, this could be it. And I kept on saying over and over in my mind, love, 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 love. And I kept on saying it because intuitively mm. I felt that if I, if I died, it was in the, the level of consciousness is actually very important. And I think we were talking about this earlier on when we were talking about mm. occult symbolism yeah, that's and the very yeah. negative aspects of occult yeah. symbolism, where when they sacrifice a victim, what they try to do is induce fear. Yeah, well, that's that's crucial. Are you yeah. right? I mean, that, going back to the fire. Yeah. From my understanding, and you know, I I, I feel maybe there was. I mean, everybody would talk about past lives, and mm. we can talk about that later if you like, but it's yeah. not necessarily a past life thing. Well, it's like a knowing. Yeah. Death through fire mm. was considered by some people within the, within the Cathar faith yeah. as being a, almost an elevation of the soul. Right. Which is the reversal within With Islam, where the body must never be destroyed by fire. Because totally, yeah, yeah, totally opposite. And... Mm. I think Giordano Bruno, the scientist in Italy from yeah. the 16th century, was also burnt to the stake yeah. for heretical views because he, he had a Gnostic kind of understanding of, of... Well, he wrote the book called Multiple Worlds. That's right, and, and he, he also questioned the validity of Jesus and all the yeah. rest of it. So but he, he was getting his knowledge from the Jesuits, so the, the point was, was not so much of what he was saying, but mm -hmm. he was actually disclosing the information that the Jesuits had told him. I read a book by um, an Italian physicist, mm -hmm. um, I think it was called uh, The Future Human Being or something, by right. Giliano Conforto, mm -hmm. and she was talking about him, Bruno, talking about death through fire and about the particles, the molecular level right. being um, absorbed mm. into a into a greater collective mm. of consciousness which yeah. will be remembered. Mm -hmm. And I think what you're saying about being on the plane mm. and not being in a state of fear but in a mm. state of love. Mm. All the stories of the Cathars being mm. burned to the stake. Yeah. Uh, you know, sometimes not just one or two mm. but there was, I think at one point there was nearly 200 at Montsega, right. the mass burning of 200 Cathar. Yeah. There was also another incident where 140 were burned, I forget where it was now. Yeah, um, so there's this massive release of consciousness. I think it was Minerve, yeah. um, not, not, not to mention the town of Bezier. But you see these mines, so these people... They, what they did, uh, Pierre, mm. is that they, they, I think they collectively joined together and I'm not advocating burning people or anything no. like that. I'm just saying, or even loving the idea of that, yeah. which is terrifying. Mm. Uh, but they, they collectively joined together mm. and went somewhere yeah. in their own yeah. level of peace. Yeah, I was going to say that so. they were uh, obviously, they could, you, you could envisage some type of uh, conscious alignment. Yes, that's what I think was happening. Yeah. And I think that's why they wouldn't give up their belief. They, yeah. wouldn't, they wouldn't take the... Um, the sacrament of the Catholic Church, yeah. and one of the other reasons why the Catholics were being persecuted as well is because of their what what was was seen as a direct smack in the face of mm. the hierarchy, right? The, you know, the Father, culture. the Son, and the Holy Spirit of yeah. Catholicism mm. was the fact that they were on the streets mm. with nothing, yeah. living in a very pious, simple life, yeah. uh, doing what we would understand today as hands-on healing, yeah. Yeah. And obviously there was the, the rituals of the consolimation mm. and, and, you know, and all of that. So they were, they were breaking with the, the hierarchy and yeah. the tradition. Mm. And uh, they were a problem mm. to, the, to, the, to the power of the church. Yeah. They compromised the, the church. Mm. Well, if, if, look at it this way, with timelines. If the, if the Cathars had been left alone, yeah. let's say the whole of the land of Lucilion had been left alone yeah. to flourish. Mm. In many ways, it, things did come from it, which were positive, but mm. if it had been left alone to flourish, you would have had a completely different perspective on, on what we have today as Christianity. Mm. Yeah. The dominant faith mm. for a majority of the so-called you know, 
well, third world, Western world being yeah. Catholicism, uh, especially in Latin American areas as right. well, um, would have been very different mm. because of the time scale that the Cathars were flourishing in. Yeah. You're looking at the 11th and 12th century yeah. bef before the Renaissance. Mm. In fact, in many ways, without going into great detail, yeah. if there hadn't have been the rise of, of the Cathars in the Languedoc yeah. and their and the spirituality that had been expressed through the likes of the troubadours, mm. the travelling priests, the harlequins of that period, yeah. the worshippers of the goddess, mm. because the goddess was venerated at castles like Privé, yeah. which is an amazing place if you ever get a chance to go. I mean, it's, it's got a very different energy to some of the other fortresses, yeah. because it wasn't a fortress. <laughs> it was a place where the arts and the goddess were celebrated, right, okay. right up until the point where, obviously, mm. it was no longer time to do that, yeah. because there was an impending danger that yeah. was coming from somewhere else. Mm. And so, left unchecked, we, mm. would have, we would have had a very different understanding of yeah. what, what became Christianity. Mm. Um, and underpinning all of this, by yeah. the way, all along throughout this has been what we understand as pa paganism right so which was always there anyway yeah, yeah. and and so the gnostics mm. and the pagans but they were, were very different in many ways but they got grouped together and but they demonized, got together yeah demonized together yeah, yeah. so so yeah um, that's actually really interesting um so uh, we well we, yeah i mean that yeah. oh yeah the other side of it is a dog I, I, on the trip, I, I met a dog. <laughs> right. Did I you didn't befriend? know the dog. No. I befriend. Well, you know, it's more than befriending, actually. I, 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 if I remember, mm -hmm. um, I think we'd camped at Puive, Yeah. And I remember we moved to another place. And I remember one day sitting at a riverbank. Yeah. And kind of, well, that's connected to. But mm -hmm. I remember this dog coming over. And, um, oh, I really connected with this dog. Right. It, I felt like I knew the soul of this animal. Yeah, right, okay. And, uh, well, you know, I want, I, I, we could have taken it with us right. because it had no owner. I mean, right. a French guy for the, for, uh, from the campsite said the farmer that owned the dog had died and the dog, mm. the dog. Mm. and the dog could have come with us. But mm. obviously, where we were going it would have been my eventual trip back to the UK it wouldn't have been very possible. But no. but this dog, I felt like yeah, I knew it, I'd met a friend, an yeah. old friend, you yeah. know. So, so uh, it sounds bizarre, but. No, well, this, but, but again, this is talking about soul, aren't you? Yeah, exactly. Because the church again doesn't acknowledge that animals have souls. Well, they didn't acknowledge that women had souls up to a certain point. <laughs> you know, that's true as well. Yeah. I mean, the church is it's as ludicrous as um, yeah. Borat. You know, yeah. the uh, the what's his name, <laughs> Sasha Cohen's character. Yeah. is hilarious, isn't it? Really, you know, the levels of lack of intelligence mm. that people fall into yeah. to believe any old rubbish. Yeah. For centuries and centuries, you know, it's um, it's time people grow up, isn't it? Really, when well, it I think people really are growing up, and I do think that there is certainly more. It's more eclectic in terms of what people actually believe, and in terms of what they're actually moving towards. You mentioned um, about the nature of the soul, and I'm very interested in in the nature of the soul, and I can tell you a little bit about my understanding about the soul, and then we could maybe discuss this, and then okay. maybe move into symbolism. I view the soul as, I, I describe it as the soul pattern, and what's interesting about the soul pattern is that it's, it, it's possible to be incarnated into the past or in, into the future, and there are different alternative realities of these pasts or the future, mm -hmm. and I think we're, in terms of meditation, meditation is designed to get you to a level of consciousness which is very similar to the imaginal state and the imaginal state is the spirit realm where anything is possible that's where everything returns back to and then that is uh, manifested again physically so I, th I see in terms of the soul pattern that can be manifested both in the past and in the future and i think knowledge of the soul pattern and knowledge of controlling the soul it's possible to control the, the timeline of the soul and how and where the soul manifests and it's possible to manifest in a better version of mm -hmm. a different reality, whether that's past or future. So that's how I actually look at the soul pattern. Um, yeah. And I don't know really how that fits in with um, Gnostic belief system. I, I probably would imagine there is some crossover there. Yeah, I think there is. I mean, it all goes back to the idea that the, the earth was a creation mm. of a 
uh, a level of consciousness. Yeah. The original Earth. This yes. Is well, you see, there are, two, the the, the, there are two creations. I think when you look at the esoteric tradition, you have the first and the second creation. And we need to be really um, clear about what that actually entails. So you've got the first creation, which is the creation of the universe and of the planets. Um, and the creation of what's known as the Anthropos. Now the term Anthropos is actually used, although the word means human, you can translate it as humanoid. And the Anthropos is described in Gnostic texts as human, but it's also described um, You're as... You're talking about human and being. And, and beings, yeah. 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 We're talking about yeah. humanoid beings, mm -hmm. such as the Seraphim are often described as the Anthropos in the same way that humans are described as the Anthropos. Now, the Seraphim are, are reptilian beings, so they're clearly not human in a literal sense, but they're human in terms of that they're sentient beings. They're humanoid. They're human-like. And so, with the first creation, you've got the creation of the Anthropos, but then, with the second creation, was the, the corruption of the Anthropos. So this was the genetic splicing of the Anthropos mm. to create grafted bloodlines, and, and ultimately the Adamic bloodline came from this and was planted on the Earth. Now, the planting on the Earth is the um, second creation in the Islamic tradition, or is known also as panspermia. So this is the beginning of, um, of humanity, which, which is the seeding of humanity on the Earth, which goes back into the traditions of, let's say, the Neo fans, the um, neo futus, the newly planted. Um, foot on a plant is related to fot, which is light. Um, and therefore, those who are initiated are connected to light. So for example, Ishman, Eshfire. But so, so you've got the, um, those of the light, but they also interconnect with the seraphim because they are mm -hmm. also born of the light. Um, seraph and Serefa, which is fire. Yeah. Which are, again, going back to the Anthropos and the grafting of the bloodlines. Yeah. So, sorry, I was going on a bit of a, a, a preamble there, but... The yeah, you, you didn't lose me, <laughs> but, yeah, but I, I've understood it. But I'm just wondering, so... But, um, I'm just trying to tie it back into yeah. what you were saying about the um, Gnostics. So... If, if we go back into the ideas of the Gnostics, I'm kind of interested in what the Gnostics thought about the relationship between angels and men. Could you, do you have opinions about that, or could you elaborate on that? Well, I mean, from my understanding of it, the, like I said earlier, that the, the Earth was, was not a, a physical place. Yeah. It is a physical place, it of is. course, yeah. but it was also a spiritual place. Right. And the, the creation of, of um, what we understand as... Uh, as what the new age and, and uh, you know science mm. is called Gaia okay yeah, there's even a channel now called Gaia isn't there yeah it's, yeah um, Gaia was, was the, the uh, mother nature yeah. um, was the spirit mm. of something that was created mm. from the dreaming yeah of a let's go, they use the word eon in, in oh, okay. the in the um, in the text mm. in the in the in the gospels that were apparently lost yeah. and then found, yeah. you know, like the Dead Sea Scrolls <laughs> in the Gnostic Gospels, they use the word eon, and right. there's been plenty of people write about this. I mean, yeah. know, John John is it John Lamb Lash's work is yeah, it's very really well good. Known, um, so it's not this is not new stuff. You know, mm. I'm not proclaiming to know no. new stuff here. Um, I mean, basically, Sophia, one of the um, aeons mm. or eons, yeah. Um, gave birth to yeah. forms mm. that would eventually become the the theatre mm. for our so-called immediate reality yeah. our solar system mm. our, our, our world mm. uh, and beyond you see our so dreaming in the aboriginal mm. understanding is yeah. also connected to the Gnostic I uh, would we'll connect to the platonic ideas of the imaginal realm of the well, universe gonna, that's what I was going to say next is that within the aboriginal teachings they talk about the human world mm. and they talk about the, the, the world of um, animals yeah. and, and the world of um, non-humans yeah. um, if, you, if you look at other things I mean, even into Marvel comics like mm. Jack Kirby's work the realm of the eternals and yeah. the, you know, I mean, it's all coming out in the Avengers and all, all the symbolism is in the movies isn't it yeah, at the moment course, yeah. um, but it's all based on this, this mm. basic understanding of different worlds, yeah. usually a trinity of worlds actually, yeah. um, which relate to what you were talking about a minute ago. Around it could be that, or it could be human, non-human angels, yeah, right. it could yeah. be demons, mm. angels and, yeah. and, and humans. And So there's this similar theme yeah. running throughout it all. Yeah. And it's kind of interesting because 
we were talking about Trinity and that kind of links into the tripartite. The, the, from my deconstruction of the Illuminati, mm -hmm. it symbolizes itself with the triangle, as you, as you already yeah, know. Yeah. But this is part of the tripartite. And what you're dealing here with the Illuminati is different versions of the Anthropos. So you've got the human, you've right. got the non-human, then you've got the grafted form, which okay, sit yeah, yeah. easily within this triangle. Well, that, that makes sense to somebody like and, me. And yeah. yeah, hence the divisions within the Illuminati, because yeah. you're dealing with different factions, which are human and, and non-human. You're dealing with the, um, not only the Trinity, but mm. something, something I, I, we were skirting around early when, when mm. I first came in, but we're talking about the, the, for me, we're looking at something that is heavily connected to the Orion constellation. Right, the symbolism because of Orion. It, it's hugely connected. Mm. Whether you're looking at the three belt stars, yeah. or whether you're looking at the pyramid structure of the what they call the Lion of God, which includes the mm. trapezium yeah. of Orion yeah. and the um, and the constellation of Rigel. Yeah, yeah. Um, Betelgeuse is another subject, but it's connected. Well, Betelgeuse links into the uh, Nephilim, the Nephilim right. will Well, I think we I mean, Betelgeuse, just hold on Betelgeuse, because uh, we can talk about that. Right. But, 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 but the, 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 tra the trapezium is crucial, I think, mm. because from what I've understood, now there's some great research out there, if anybody's interested, yeah. there's, there's the, the work of Danny Wilton, which is, mm -hmm. you know, his videos are fantastic, right. those YouTube videos that mm -hmm. he's made. And there's an e-book as well, which I read, which mm -hmm. only looks at art, mm -hmm. only art in right. terms of its symbolism, a couple of other things. But if you're really interested in looking closely at the symbolism, mm -hmm. you'll find that within the Orion Nebula, yeah there is a trapezium mm. which is a, a kind of a, um, a an area of supernova yeah. where stars are born mm. and incident, interestingly it's it's next to the the sword of orion actually mm. it's in the same area and we were talking about we were talking about the sword cherubim. and the and the cherubim mm. and the protecting the tree of knowledge in genesis yeah. Yeah. and and he and he put a flaming sword yeah. he who's he but I'll come back mm. to that but put a flaming sword in front of the tree of knowledge yeah. to protect it mm. Um, it seems to me that there are many forces at work yeah. on different levels of creation mm. that are predominantly centred around what we understand in our reality as the Orion constellation. Yes. Yeah. Uh, whether it's the monkey head or mm. nebula or the you know the, the <laughs> yeah. probably Bernard's loop, which is in there. Uh, the Orion nebula is crucial because mm. it's 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 where the trapezium is. Yeah. It's where it sits, mm. and the Mayans, of course. And the Hopi are we talking about aligned all of their mm. homesteads and their rituals with the Orion? Are we talking about the trapezium here being the um, sort of uh, the pyramid without the capstone? Yeah, it, but it, but it, it, it is the cap. It, it is the capstone. It's yeah. the pyramid that is the capstone, right. and, and more often than not, it has the so-called eye of the providence yeah. right in the center of the. Um, of the pyramid and, structure. And what I think what's quite interesting there is that the eye itself links into the symbolism of the watchers because the Hebrew word erin, which is a watcher, also means a shining one. So the eye is represented as shining. Now the word ear is, is related to El, which are the Elohim, because the Elohim are the high ones or the watchers, the shining ones. Mm. Uh, again, in the Greek, you've got drakos, which is the old Greek. Um, it, it's used in the classical symbolism yeah. to refer to an eye. And drachon, which is to watch or to shine. So you're looking here at polyglottal word plays, word plays which play out in many different languages. Right. And we were talking about earlier about the holographic nature of reality and how that feeds into holographic numbers. But you see the same similarity with languages as well. So languages themselves have this if you like universal structure or this universal grammar as I think what Chomsky talked about. But the the gram the universal grammar is confirmed by these polyglottal symbols or polyglottal word plays which are found repeated in many different languages. Well you're looking at the the, the the microscopic levels of reality, like like platonic solids. And yes, yeah, and how they play out at the macro. And we were talking earlier about I was talking about the tetrahedron yeah. being, you know, the smallest mm. and out of all out of tetrahedrons come all the other all the different shapes. solids yeah. and um, we were talking about the black pyramid being yeah. found in Ecuador mm. which is not a pyramid it's a tetrahedron mm. and it has the 33 bricks and the eye at the top and under ultraviolet light it, mm. it lights up and it's got the Orion constellation on its base mm. and I can't help but feel that I mean I can understand why it's called a pyramid, but it's actually a tetrahedron. A tetrahedron. So um, you can't help but feel that the building blocks of creation, the building blocks let's of use that as a term, 
is is on a non-physical level yeah. whether it's through coding genetics eventually mm. yeah. in the garden of eden mm. the garden of eden in the stars yeah i think i read somewhere and i mentioned it in the book about the word padre or padra coming from the idea of um, it relating to a garden in the stars right. there was another definition for a right. nursery for a nursery mm. and and what's interesting is that some of the african shamans mm. not least um, the zulu were talking about the caves of creation yeah. where women and men were seeded mm. and when you look closely at the Orion Nebula there seems to be what looks like a pink cave and a blue cave right. which make up that area yeah. around the trapezium yeah. which could well be the source of genetics yeah, because and life as we know it could be we're not saying it is yeah. but there's enough evidence to suggest that there's some kind of mm. um, construct, mm. um, non-physical construct, yeah. creating the physical world of duality mm. that is projected from what we would understand the tree of knowledge, the tree of life, because I and think then the garden in the stars. I think, like when you talk about Orion, there are two big um, stars which are associated in symbolism, in messianic symbolism. That would be Regal and then Betelgeuse. Ah, well, you know what's interesting because I know you. You've talked about Japan in the past mm. and things like that in your books. Mm. What I found interesting was um, when I started looking at this chapter for this, are you this new about, book. Are you looking at the Mount, uh, Mount I'm, Fuji? I'm, lo I'm, lo I'm, thinking, no, I'm thinking about the samurai. Right. Because the samurai, I read somewhere, and I've got it in the book. In fact, I'll, I'll, I'll read it to you because I can't remember the actual well, you know the what the, you, you know what the, the, name you know what the, the word ninja means? No. It's a wordplay. It, 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 it means uh, Brothers of the Serpent. Oh, well, when you break down the Chinese characters, it's, it's a natural wordplay. How interesting. So, as I was looking at this kind of eternal war which, that was going on. Which is on. the Pythagorean school. I mean, I mean, the ninjas would be affiliated to the Pythagorean school if you want to bring it back into classics. Oh, here we are. The, I don't know how you pronounce it. Is it the Tiari, the Heike? Is it the Heike? Heike he, clan? Yeah, Heike clan. Heike clan. Adopted Beetlejuice as its symbol, right. while the opposite clan adopted the Minamoto, adopted um, Rigel as its symbol. Yeah, and shoot, all the, shoot, now Beetlejuice is, the, is where the Nephilim originated from, and Rigel is where the Adamic man was created. So why would the samurai, I mean of course they adopted other things, but well, they adopted, adopted that in their moms, you know the heralds Well there are three moms. levels to the Illuminati, so there are two parts of the tripartite. Or that, well, so you've got so a third clan which is not mentioned. But, so you would have the human. I couldn't find them. Yeah, <laughs> they're but maybe they're the ninja, the, brother, the brothers of the serpent. Well, there you go. Because, I mean, look, I mean, see, what's interesting is that, mm. you know, I'm getting too carried away with it, but I'm doing the research yeah. and this obsession with horns. Mm. I mean, the samurai yeah. were horns. horns. And the circle, which is found in Egypt. Yeah, but did you... But the armour as well. Yeah. The, the body armour mm. and the armour that you find in other cultures it's very you know, isn't it, it? It's, ve it's very transformers well that's <laughs> <laughs> it's very Decepticon it isn't is, it yeah. you know, yeah. and I joke all the time people who yeah. know my social media I'm always joking about the transformers yeah. running the planet yeah. in fact my art students love it they think yeah. I'm mad but you know yeah. I keep saying you know your overlords yeah. that your overlords are actually one day you'll be making a cup of tea and it'll go <laughs> ching 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 it'll change into something and you'll think yeah. shit it's too late they're here so um, yeah, but with transformers <laughs> is the modern mythology isn't it because yeah, you've it got is, yeah. you've got an inner and outer meaning so there's always a subtext behind the symbolism within the movie and I think that because I have read some um, of your deconstructions on the Transformer movies and uh, you obviously talk about this strong connection there with Orion. Well, I'm convinced, this is my feeling, no. shoot me down in flames, but I'm, I'm convinced that the, the, the artificial intelligence, right, okay. which we have, I'm going to say this clearly, mm. so we have been given, mm. it's been handed to us yeah. by something else. Yeah. We've not invented artificial no. intelligence. We've been encouraged to create it. It's yeah. been handed to us. Yeah. I think it's been given to us by what we would perceive to be some kind of alien yeah. life form. Yeah. Just a bit like yeah. the trans. I mean, I know it's a movie, yeah. you know, yeah. but just like the Transformers yeah. um, were trying to bring Cybertron to Earth yeah. in the movies, mm. Artificial intelligence, which is a living mm. entity yeah. of a lower level, mm. it's not human intelligence at yeah. the highest level, it's yeah. lower level. Do you think this is trying to create a planet mm. that is artificially intelligently controlled to its core? Right. That's and everything, agenda. all the agenda mm. 
throughout history, mm. the Illuminati stuff, the Freemasonic stuff, it's all about the time we're in now yeah. and the battle between human intelligence of the heart yeah. against the lower intelligence, the mechanical, which is mechanical artificial intelligence. Yeah. And at some point, the two will meet mm. and they will have to deal with each other. Yeah. When you're looking at young people staring at their mobile phones on a daily basis, yeah. and, and old people now. Well, it must change the structure of the brain. Well, it's not only doing that, you, you, which it is, it's also making them become the different type of human yeah. that they were programmed well, do, do, to mean, be or not to be. You know what I'm saying? So I mean, in Exo Politics, they talk about the Homo Noeticus, which is the new human. Do you think that this feeds into these type of ideas? Yeah, it does feed into it. But, but you, the, pr predominantly, you've got to come back to what is human and what yeah. is being, yeah. and the difference between organic life yeah. and and artificial intelligent life forms, which are as, uh, are as alive mm. as a plant. Or, or a bird. A sent in. You see, um, Turin also talked about, um, he, well, he talked about the oracle. And I think the oracle is very interesting because that implies that something is actually channeled. So this idea that an intelligence, rather than it just making decisions based on how we would view it as a, a binary decisions, um, yes or no, zero or one, but it's actually channeled from somewhere. Mm. And uh, I think Turing, in, in, in his own experiments, he factored in ESP. And, and so oh, yeah. telepathy was viewed as being very important. And I know in terms I of... I think it was a human trait. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, if you go... I mean, this is a big subject, this yeah. here. You could go all the way back to, to, you know, everything that you've ever seen on documentaries yeah. uh, on ancient aliens mm -hmm. and things like that, to Bigfoot. Yeah. It's all connected to You see, this. I've got, um, where I looked at in, in my new book, Holographic Culture, I looked at the Karen, which are um, the jinn, but I've come to the conclusion that there is this intelligence which is interfacing with the human mind, and so we presume that our own thoughts are, are real and that there are actual thoughts, but they're being interfered with with this artificial intel intelligence. I, I would go with that. I mean, I, I'll give you a good example of that, is, um, and it's happened to me. Mm -hmm is where you're, you never mind having a conversation, yeah. you are thinking mm. about a particular subject, yeah. and it may well be that you've been thinking about it randomly, or yeah. you were focused on it, whichever, yeah. you might, and then you, you go and browse mm. something on social media or the internet, yeah. and coincidentally, mm. Something crops up mm. on a feed or a news feed yeah. that was connected to the most private thoughts that you were having. Yeah. Now that's not. Never mind. We know that Facebook listens in, and yeah. we know that the algorithms yeah. uh, are yeah. already set to yeah. be able to transmute mm. what you're talking about, and they yeah. give you surprise, surprise, a couple of YouTube videos based yeah. on the subject you were talking to your mate about. Yeah. We know about that. Yeah, but we're, but, talking, but about we're talking about another level here, yeah. which oh, is yeah, that thinking. That would be a creative visualisation technique, though, wouldn't it? If you're yeah. manifesting that through that like kind through of thought, through yeah. it, into intention. Yeah, and that's you, true, yeah. You see, I came to the conclusion when I started studying this that these beings, that they can read the thought patterns of an ant. And I, I, this comes back to what they're actually interested in. I actually think that they're very interested in mining intelligence, but they're also interested in mining um, emergent systems of thought in terms of we're talking about systems such as evolutionary mm. um, thinking and thoughts. We, and so here we're dealing with a, a predacious um, being or predacious species. And they've worked out that in order to be at the top of the food chain, that, that in a continually changing, in a continually evolving universe, that they have to outsmart the predator. The predator is always very smart. And so they're using what, what I believe that they've, they've colonized thousands of planets and they're all at different stages of evolution. And they're using um, systems, and again, they're using systems of division in order to um, create these emergent systems to effectuate and to try and facilitate yeah. and encourage these systems. I, I, I agree. 